Welcome to the Texas Medical Association's Distance Learning Center. Timely, convenient education from TMA, your trusted source for practice and professional needs. We would like to thank Pfizer for sponsoring this free program for TMA's Leadership College. Hello, I'm Robert Strauss. I'm an emergency physician. I practice at the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm a senior vice president for Team Health, and I run the American College of Emergency Physicians uh, Director's Academy, a four-phase curriculum uh, to help develop leadership and administrative skills for emergency physician leaders. Today, we're going to talk about running effective meetings. Meetings can be very frustrating uh, for all of us because they don't seem to accomplish what it is uh, that we've come to, uh, to, to do. Now, one, one answer is this one provided by Woody Allen. Just show up. Now, there is great wisdom here. Showing up will prevent those, those people who, t- like the cowardly lion, will yell, scream, and complain about you if you're not there. But certainly, certainly, there must be a, more, uh, a better reason for participating in meetings. The value of meetings. How much time do you spend in meetings, doing the work for meetings or preparing for them? Administrative uh, physicians, uh, perhaps like you, certainly like me, spend, uh, will tell me that they spend between 10 and 50 percent of their time actually in meetings, preparing for them, or the most work, which is doing the work that's been assigned at the meetings. Now, that's okay if meetings are valuable. If they're not valuable, then it's a terrible waste of all of our time. I'm going to provide three video clips and then discuss them briefly. There are so, they are somewhat caricatures of what goes wrong. Uh, the first is a terribly uh, disorganized uh, meeting that has been poorly planned. It's called Dealing with Socializers and Eliminating Parallel Play. The next item we have on our agenda is from the Quality Assurance Committee. Alan, when you're ready, go ahead and tell us how we're doing. Thank you, Gretchen. JACO, which stands for the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organ- Organizations, evaluates and accredits more than 15,000 healthcare or- It's an independent, not-for-profit organization. The Joint Commission is the nation's body in healthcare. How was dinner at the restaurant last night? Oh, it was great. The ambiance was terrific. We had a private room and the wine list was just exceptional. What did you have? We had the Cabernet Sauvignon, the Stag's Leap. It was really good with the um, beef entree. Is it just me or does the staff on the fourth floor seem pretty flaky? I mean, there's been a lot of turnover lately and we're constantly having to reorient the new nurses to our group's protocols. If someone's not getting married, there's someone having a baby, there's just always an excuse. It's frustrating. All the good nurses never seem to stay. Exactly. Health organizations and programs, the United States. It's an independent, not-for-profit organization. So let's discuss what happened. What are the causes of poor attention to a topic? Well, certainly boredom. This was an uninspiring topic, uh, an inappropriate presentation. This was so poorly done. There were way too many words on the on the screen. And in fact, it was just plain uninterested. Now, certainly there could be some insincere participants, people who are the wrong people to be in the room, but that was not the case this time. What happened with the presentation? Well, everyone seemed bored. This was not an issue that was of interest to the group. There was no engagement, and uh, the lights were turned off. Now, that's okay to turn off the lights, but hopefully what's going to be appearing on the screen is going to be riveting and interesting to the people. So let's assume that you are the chair and directing this meeting. Once the side conversation begins, how can you get people more focused uh, on on the, the, the topic? Well, you could ask a socializer a simple but not embarrassing question, never humiliate somebody, such as, well, what do you think the point of this particular topic on, on the Joint Commission is. Or ask the group, you simply ask the group uh, to please 
focus on the discussion, uh, or even ask the speaker, in this case, it might have been quite wise to, to ask the speaker to, um, to really refocus and describe the salient points. However, this was a pro this particular presentation was a problem when it began and should have been addressed prior to beginning. While it's a little bit of work, the chair is absolutely responsible for the content of the meeting. What might have happened in advance was simply to review the presentation in advance, the salient points, the issues that uh, should be discussed, describe uh, specifically uh, its duration, and make it an action-oriented, engaging process. So review with the presenter what will be discussed. Now, how would you answer the question if you were uh, in a meeting that if I didn't have to go to meetings, I would, would I like my job more? Most people will say yes. Are the meetings the low point of my day? Unfortunately, many people will say yes. Very few people will say meetings are the high point of their day, and almost invariably that's because they're running the meeting. Most people, even management leaders, think that meetings are a waste of their time, 78% uh, uh, according to this Communispond uh, poll. Uh, it's unfortunate because uh, gather, we're gathering intelligent, passionate, thoughtful people on a topic that should have to do with their work, their, their patients, the operations, something that should be making their lives better. So it, when we find that so many people believe that these are a waste of time, we know that something should be done. So how do we get our training to lead meetings? How did you get yours? Many people will say it was on-the-job training or I just saw people doing it incorrectly, so I'm, I'm going to do it differently. Very few people have actually been to a course and have gotten uh, an ACPE, um, uh, we've gone through ACPE or gotten an MBA, but most people really haven't learned. And how do we get to be leaders in meetings? Very often it's simply because we raised our hand at the wrong time. Uh, and so now we're in charge. So there are meetings that are poor, and when asked, I, most people will say that they're just terribly, uh, terribly organized. The, perhaps the, the members don't participate. They're uninterested. They're unprepared. They don't complete their, their assignments. They show up late. The meetings themselves are disorganized. They're boring. There is no control of time. They're a waste of time. Nothing got accomplished. They start late. They run over time. Or the chair maybe sets the wrong tone. They're talkative, unprepared, don't communicate well, uh, don't follow the agenda, and they uh, are lackadaisical, perhaps sullen, and ridiculing. So uh, all three of these are the reasons for poor meetings. But meetings can be good. The characteristics of a good meeting are uh, dynamic, passionate, focused, engaged process that extracts the collective wisdom of, of a team. The goal is to transform this painful, tedious process into something productive, compelling, and even energizing. To distinguish our meetings, they've got to be well-conducted, time-efficient, meaningful, and focused. So th in this brief discussion, we're going to talk about whether to have or not to have a meeting. Rarely considered how to prepare in advance often considered but not commonly done. How to conduct the meeting, always done but often poorly, and then what to do after the meeting ends other than to have a good cry. So let's talk about whether or not to have a meeting. Uh, there are many meetings that we have that are monthly meetings. It's always surprising to me that we can always, every month, have a meeting that lasts exactly two hours and covers all of the important information. Oh, that is every month except August when we all take a month off. Unfortunately, again, most meetings become rituals uh, rather than meetings to accomplish very specific and focused goals. So whether or not to have it, there are times not to have a meeting. When would you not want to have it? When you already know the answer. There's no buy-in necessary, no information to transmit. 
and there's nothing important that uh, the participants uh, need to know. But there are two reasons to have a meeting. Reason number one, of course, is a problem-solving meeting. This tends to be a smaller group of people. This is a, a meeting where we need input and, importantly, buy-in. These are more nuanced meetings, and they accomplish very specific goals. Uh, people leave with specific action items, and problems are solved. The other type of meeting is an information exchange, more like the type of meeting we're having right now. It's built for the simultaneous dissemination of uh, information that is uh, apparently important to the participants. You've actually volunteered to attend. Now, ideally, these meetings, uh, if done well, have uh, uh, have audio visuals and uh, specifically allow an opportunity to discuss discuss issues. For all meetings, we must prepare in advance. This is uh, it's it, it, much like a wedding. Advanced planning leads to success. What does that entail? Well, it entails the person leading the meeting to, in advance, determine what he or she would like to accomplish. And then I say this somewhat figuratively, write the minutes before the meeting. Not literally, but the person leading the meeting should absolutely know what it is that they are attempting to accomplish and the way that they intend to get there. The component is creating an essential agenda. I believe that we should be using action verbs. In what is an agenda? It's a roadmap, it's a timetable, it's an overview, it's a goal setter. It cues the person leading the meeting it enlists the attention of the members and keeps people all moving in the same direction. So I'm going to show you a, another video, and this one is called Poor Preparation. This is what happens when preparation by the leader of the meeting uh, does not occur. Oh, well, sorry I didn't have time to prepare an agenda today. What would you like to talk about? Uh, we could continue our discussion on the new safety standards. Good idea. We were going to revise our Sentinel event procedure. Drina, you were going to look into how others are identifying and reporting these. Yeah, but I didn't think that was due today. Well, why don't we start by reviewing our current event report process? Does anybody have a copy of their protocol with them? Well, we've got to get this done. I don't want to waste any of your time. Give me a couple of minutes and I'll go grab it. Oh. Be right back. So what happened? There was no agenda, no plan, no preparation, and the meeting continued. This seems incredibly rude to me. It's the chair's responsibility to value the people and their time. To be unprepared delivers the message that my, as the chair, my time uh, not preparing but doing something else is more important than your time. So as a result of not being prepared, what are the options? One is to postpone the meeting. Two, to continue to bumble through. And three is to select a very specific item that the group can solve uh, uh, briefly. The problem with postponing a meeting once people have gotten there is that many people will have traveled a good distance, disrupted their day, so it is absolutely incumbent upon us to accomplish something that's of value. Ideally, this wouldn't have occurred in the first place because there was excellent preparation. Let's talk about the agenda, and we'll use the example of uh, developing care maps. Having no agenda, well, obviously that's a problem. Let's try a different one. Meet between 8 and 9 to discuss care maps. Well, the problem with that, that's an appointment. That's not an agenda. Discuss the pros and cons of care maps. That's a debate. 
that's not an agenda. So how should an agenda begin? <clears throat> well, an agenda should always begin with uh, a orientation, uh, creating vision, uh, setting tone, describing the importance. We must share with the people with whom we're meeting what we want them, where we want them to go in order to get them there. Without this process of orientation, member, members have the potential to be moving in different directions. Now is the time to set the tone that this is important and describe what will be accomplished during the meeting so that people have the map. Next, after discussing goals, there again, if you notice, there are action items. Describe existing programs, list equipment, define the IT support, describe the rollout in education, and note particularly that we start with simple, easier processes rather than the more complex and difficult issues. It's similar to warming up for an athletic event. You start by stretching and taking it, uh, taking uh, loosening up. In this case, uh, early, simple discussions and agreement will set the tone for collaboration later on. Now, there will always be naysayers in, uh, in meetings that are important and review critical and important issues. We want different opinions. Uh, that, again, creates nuanced and valuable solutions. But why put it to the end? Well, the advantage of creating, uh, of putting the, uh, the roadblocks to success, which are necessary at the end, is it allows people to suspend disbelief early on. So one can simply say, uh, if, if you let them interrupt, if you let naysayers interrupt early, uh, you may get way off track and, uh, and, and lose uh, the ability to move forward. So uh, roadblocks, again, are necessary. Uh, what one can say is, yes, uh, if somebody interrupts with, a, um, with, with some roadblock, uh, we absolutely will discuss these problems. You're right. These are important. For now, let's discuss what it would be like if we were able to overcome the problems and if we accomplish the best outcome. Uh, naysayers are important, and they must have their opportunity. It just organizes the time that they will speak if you allow it to occur at the end. Effective agendas avoid pandemonium. As I showed you, take easier items early. Make sure that our meetings are accomplishable. Sometimes we try to squeeze too much into a much too small space, creating some degree of pandemonium and great frustration. Uh, it's awkward, it's uncomfortable. Ideally, we will end our meetings on time or even a little bit early. Now we're going to discuss setting the setting. How do you set up the room? How do you set up the table? Well, there are different ways of doing that. This kind of meeting, an information transmission meeting in a large room, you have uh, the presenter in front. Why is it set up this way and everybody else sitting facing in the same direction? So that the presenter can simultaneously see everybody and the participants can simultaneously see the, the presenter but have little opportunity for interaction with anybody with the possible exception of somebody sitting on either side of them. Um, this is an information transmission meeting. It works very effectively, as opposed to uh, a, a meeting that's a problem-solving meeting. Notice that the presenter, zero in this case, or O, is less of a leader. They're more equal. Everyone is enabled and encouraged to present. It's great for solving problems. It's less good for leading and influencing decision because everybody has the opportunity to influence. This is a decentralized process. It allows careful deliberations. Solutions are slow. They're arduous, but they are, again, they are much more nuanced, and there is substantial buy-in by the participants. So the concept here is that unless the affected participants are part of the plan, they will be less able to support the solution. Again, it's slower, but the solution is longer lasting. Now we're going to take an example. Well, here we have a, a, a typical table 
uh, a meeting table. You, uh, at, on the left, uh, have the gavel. Uh, for this example, we have uh, people A, B, C, D, E, and F, and then the X's along the bottom. Why is it that leaders tend to sit at the head of the table and people who tend to sit at the head of the table turn out to be leaders? It's the same concept. It, you may simul you have the opportunity to simultaneously see everybody, and everybody can simultaneously see you. It creates a position uh, of power. Now, when we look at this, then let's let's take the same concept. You now uh, are sitting either at A or C. Who in this example has more power? Well, again, like most good question, the answer is it depends. C can influence the person on either side and with very little eye movement can see and influence five people across the table. Very hard to influence the people uh, sitting on the same side of the table a couple people away. A, on the other hand, has less influence. Again, the person on either side and using the same angle of vision can only influence three people. There are many that A cannot influence. Now, the exception here is, of course, that A has the potential to influence the leader of the meeting. So there, it may be wise if you have something that you want to uh, intermittently, quietly whisper into the leader's ear uh, to be sitting at A. Otherwise, you may wish to sit at C or at F. F is, again, another position of power. F, like the leader of the meeting, can become a leader. When F is speaking, everybody can see that person at the same time, and that person can see everybody. So this can become a very powerful position in a meeting. So let's talk about where would you want to place uh, a... Uh, somebody who is perhaps a difficult person, uh, a powerful opponent, you'd want to place them at A because they have little influence over other people and you have the potential to have influence over them. How about a pair of socializers? If you could place them, you'd of course want to place them with somebody between them, such as A and C or B and E. Less likely, now this could only be accomplished uh, by some form of manipulation, such as place cards. Where would you want to put uh, an overly talkative person? Again, in a corner. How about somebody who is a little bit shy, but when they speak, they say very important things? Again, you might want to put them at F, another position of great uh, influence. So let's move from now we've set the meeting, we've decided to have it, we've, we've got the agenda, it's all set up, let's lead the meeting. Uh, unfortunately, many of our meetings are poorly run. Uh, a poorly run meeting is very much like a poorly run resuscitation. No matter what the outcome, no matter how successful the outcome, if there are many voices speaking simultaneously, people will all feel like things should have and could have gone better. Uh, most of us have very little formal training in meetings, and it's not surprising that uh, meetings are not run particularly well. So what should one do as the director of a meeting? create a positive first impression. We must set the tone. What you project will significantly influence the members. If sarcastic, late, slumped, lackadaisical, disinterested, and unfocused, so will other people be. Uh, if we arrive on time or early, we're sincere, even enthusiastic, sit forward, not slouch. Demonstrate interest and vision. Hook them early understand and make it important to those who are there. Now, perhaps perhaps not Hamlet, but it must be about what's important to them, their future, their families, their practice, things that are important to those that are present. Leadership is the ability to make sure 
that the issues of the people who are present are accomplished. There are some who, when they finally become chairs of a division or a department or chair or, or president of the medical staff, think, well, finally things are going to be done my way. Things are finally going to occur the right way. And yet, it is not the reason we should. It is not our goals that must be accomplished. Our responsibility is to lead the committee to recognize common goals and help them to accomplish them. I'm going to give you a personal example of a good friend of mine, Bruce Judson, who was twice featured on the Wall Street Journal uh, uh, business section, came up to me at, at the end of four years of my chairing uh, uh, an organization and its meetings. And uh, he said, Rob, I can't wait till our next meeting. And I said, why that, Bruce? He said, well, uh, I, I can't wait till you're no longer chairing the meeting. And now I thought, well, this was not going to be a, a good answer or one I wanted to hear. But I asked why. He said, because finally, beginning the next meeting, when you're not chair, I'm going to get to know your opinion. And I felt that this was a great compliment. Now, we as leaders can take stands, but we should only take stands when we know the outcome. I was a participant in a, on a board, and the, it was the first meeting where I was present uh, as a new board member, and the uh, new president of this board who had just become president. And uh, upon calling the meeting to order, he asked for an executive session. So only board members were there. All staff were asked to leave. He, his first comment was, either she, the executive director, goes or I go. We had about an hour very difficult discussion about this. There were 12 of us, and since he was only voting in tiebreakers, the vote indeed was 11 to nothing, that she stayed. Now, he stayed also which led to very poor credibility for the rest of his presidency. <clears throat> if it's important, if it's critical, if you and I have an issue that is that you believe is very important to get accomplished at this meeting and you think that it may not be so easy, the process is to perform pre-meeting jawboning. What does that mean? That means spend time with individuals prior to the meeting. If we can't convince them one-on-one, -on -one, it is highly unlikely that we'll be able to do it during the meeting. So we talked about no clear agenda. We talked uh, briefly about <coughs> meetings that in which we don't accomplish all we set out to accomplish. The, according to Blanchard's one-minute manager, the third major issue that we find in meetings is uh, that they are wandering, that there's no control. The discussions go in a group of directions. So these meetings, then, are, are the worst ones to me. Very little gets accomplished. We all get frustrated, and when, particularly when the, the discussion is on the third level of digression. Now, on this next, next slide, <coughs> the, we're going to talk, uh, I'm going to show you a video about getting the derailed train back on track. How can we deal with these uh, digressions that so frequently occur? Now we're going to discuss the changes in the formulary. First on the list is the removal of Lovenox and replacement with Fragmin. Oh, that's too bad. I'm so used to using Lovenox and it works so well with my patients. Any idea why the pharmacy wants to make that change? Well, the last time they made a change like that, it was to save money for the hospitals. You know, it's frustrating to me that we can't use the medications that work. That's so typical here, save money but making it increasingly difficult to practice. I'm getting so fed up. I know what you mean. Just last week, I was getting pressured from the case manager to release a patient before they were ready to go home. That's my license on the line, my malpractice. Exactly. I mean, have you seen what's been going on with malpractice rates lately? It's nuts. It's all these damn malpractice attorneys. And I just got sued. I'm telling you, it's just not fair. Really? What happened? Well, there's some deadbeat patient doesn't want to pay me, so now he's suing me. 
So what is the cause of digressions? Well, there are lots of causes. Very often we all, we all have hot button issues. And our button gets pushed because we're preoccupied with something that's part of our personal agenda. We often have a desire to tell personal stories and discuss personal anecdotes. Or perhaps we're bored and don't have a clear understanding of the current topic. So what's necessary for digressions to continue unabated? Essentially, nothing. If we do nothing, they will continue. We do have a responsibility. What is necessary to get the discussion back on track? Well, I first believe that we should always use the theory of yes. It is always possible to affirm a person's point of view, to appreciate their input, even validate their input. It's important. So in this case, when the person began speaking about the case manager controlling the care, one could simply say, yes, this is important. We've all felt some discomfort about that. Let's discuss how to address that after this meeting and make sure it gets to the right committee for discussion. Or for the person who starts talking about the malpractice situation and how terrible it is, again, validate and then get back to the primary issue. You bet, malpractice is a real problem. Unfortunately, we won't be able to solve it here. Let's focus on the issue over which we do have some control. Uh, again, methods include the parking lot and taking it offline and then refocusing on the original agenda. I believe our mantra should continue to be are we massaging this discussion forward? Ask yourself, are we moving forward? Is this pertinent? Is it redundant? Have we heard this? Is it a, uh, a repetition of what was just said? Uh, so there are methods of shaping. Uh, recount the different opinions. Let them know that you heard, and it makes it unnecessary for them to state it again. Yes, uh, Janet, you said that you've had great experience with care maps and you believe they should occur. Robert, I, I understand that you've had some bad experiences, and in particular because one size doesn't fit all. Are those the two opinions? Is there anything more anybody would like to say? Okay, let's move the discussion forward. Uh, at a certain point, we have to conclude the meeting. I believe that we should have uh, that we should use this management action plan. This one is a little bit more complex than the one we usually see because it's got a couple of extra steps. Of course, the the date, the action step or expected outcome, uh, implement uh, implement care maps might be the expected outcomes. The measurable objective by X date, we will have developed and reviewed three uh, care maps. The person responsible, start date, target date, and again, what progress have we made and what barriers have, have uh, we found? Barriers that we have found may then lead back to new action steps, and then the date completed or the, the current status. So we've talked about reviewing uh, what is to be done, the management action plan. I believe that it is valuable to end a meeting a few minutes in advance, to be careful to allow a few extra minutes. Even in large meetings uh, with 20, 25 people, I will then, at the end of the meeting, say we've come to the conclusion of our agenda. Is there anybody who has some burning critical issue that if they don't say it, they will feel that they uh, lost an important opportunity? I want you each to nod if you don't not know if you don't have any, and then I visually walk around the room. Invariably, one or two people will have some hot button issue that they want to put on the table. Uh, occasionally. That's an issue that requires more discussion, at which point one can simply say, yes, this is important. Why don't you and I, after the meeting, figure out how we can ensure that it gets discussed and gets the right amount of attention? Uh, this way, people don't leave the meeting frustrated that what they thought should occur uh, did not. Schedule the next meeting, and then I believe it is important to intermittently assess the effectiveness of a meeting. 
And the way to do that is simply survey the participants. Here's an example of a survey. Um, of course, it's, it's been reformatted so you can see it, but was the meeting effective uh, and efficient, productive? Uh, did people live up to their responsibilities? Uh, do we maintain a, maintain a focus on improving whatever it is that you think, but that way you, as the leader, can get feedback on what on whether it worked or not. With that, uh, I will conclude. I appreciate the time that you've spent with me. I hope this has been of some value to you. Thank you very much. This concludes our program. Questions? Contact the TMA Knowledge Center at 1-800-880-7955. Thank you for using the TMA Distance Learning Center.